Hi. Tonight I'm going to do a video on the assembly of an LED lighting fixture. A few weeks ago my son came to me and was asking about LED lighting for his fish tanks. And so I did a little bit of research and I was kind of impressed with the uh, development of these cobs or chip on board devices. It used to be to get usable output from an LED you had to assemble a whole uh, cluster of 3 watt diodes and sometimes even mix colors in order to try to get a broad spectrum. But what they've done is they've evolved to put hundreds of emitters on a single chip so that you only have two leads, a positive and a negative, coming into it. And this particular unit that comes from Cree, which is one of the world's best manufacturers, Philips is another good competitor, will handle up to 100 watts of input and because it's so efficient at 140 lumens per watt, this particular module will make over 14,000 lumens. That's as much light as one of the fixtures in this room makes. And it's about 40% more efficient than the next most efficient source of lighting, which is the high output T5 fluorescence, which is what we have in this room. It's more efficient than HID lighting. It's more efficient than any of the other fluorescent lightings, and we won't even talk about incandescent lightings. In addition, these chips come in a variety of color temperatures. You can get them all the way from about 2800, which is quite yellow, up to blue at about 6500. And they're all based on the gallium nitride emitter, which produces a deep blue output. It's actually what we use in some of the blue laser diodes take off the cavity mirrors and you have a very efficient source of blue light. What makes the white light of these and the different varieties of white lights, uh, white light is the uh, mixing of different phosphors that are placed on top of the diodes. The company that I located to sell me this diode uh, called Rapid LED is not a sponsor of the channel. They didn't even give me a break on the uh, components here. But what's nice about them is they have a menu, a different uh, drop-down menu for all the little components that you would need in order to build the fixture. And they're all compatible so that you don't have to cobble together components from eBay and looking around the house. And these components will make it possible for you to assemble this thing without even doing any soldering. You'll probably want to, but it's that uh, simple that uh, what I'll demonstrate here is something that I'm going to do in real time, and you'll see it doesn't take very long. Uh, in addition to selling the LEDs, they sell brackets that are used to retain the LEDs on the heat sink. They're already mounted with um, clips for the electrodes. They've even designated the polarity, which is very important with LEDs. If you reverse the power or the driving polarity, you can destroy them. So they mark a little positive symbol on the front of the bracket so that you'll line up the LED correctly on the back surface. And if you look carefully on the other side of this bracket, you'll see that there is a positive marking here too, so that when you're looking at the back side of the LED, you're going to be able to align it. You'll also notice if you look carefully at the LED itself, there's a small positive marking where the positive polarity is supposed to go into the diode. And one thing that you might want to do, which is kind of a neat little trick, is I've been using red to mark the positives. I'm just going to put a little red dot in that corner so that I keep the polarity correct when I assemble it. They sell thermal pads, so you don't need to use messy thermal grease. They even cut them to the right dimensions. They sell brackets that hold reflectors. They all are compatible. They even sell this honking big heat sink. This, uh, this heat sink, it's not very expensive, uh, but it has over two square meters of surface area. And because of the large surface area, even with 100 watts going into this, you don't need to use a fan. So when you install a light like this, you don't then have the additional noise that would be associated with a blower. They also provide this pre-drilled and tapped for M3 screws so that you can mount a variety of chips and a variety of brackets on this without doing any drilling and tapping. They've also tapped the sides of these. Frequently people will put little chain hangers in order to support these things, say from the ceiling above uh, some surface where they want to um, 
produce some lighting. They can put them in an array or a rack in order to illuminate a large area. But again, everything is pre-drilled, makes it very easy to work with. The important thing though is they do provide drivers, but I didn't get my driver from them simply because I wanted something a little different. If you want the most lumens per watt or most lumens per dollar, uh, what you can do is you can assemble these diodes to work in series and each one has about a 36 volt drop so that you can get drivers that can provide between two and three hundred volts of DC power and power as many as six or seven of these lights in series. It's more efficient in terms of cost but because I'm going to be mounting this thing above an aquarium and because this is going to be running a couple of amps 250 volts at a couple of amps above water is not cool. So I decided to spring for a little extra money and get an individual driver that operates at about 36 volts for each of the lights. This particular driver is a Meanwell driver and I like it because it's plastic. It doesn't have the sharp edges of a metal can that you'll see on a lot of drivers. It's sealed. It also is dimmable. And one of the things that you'll also notice on the cords that come in and out of it are ferrite beads that prevent the high frequencies that are generated by the switching power supply from entering your wall or entering the light. So very nice device, including a way to dim it. These two leads that come out uh, can allow you to dim the LED light by three different methods. One, pulse width modulation. You could hook this up to an Arduino or a computer in order to be able to dim this uh, automatically. You can send in a 0 to 10 volt DC signal from another source, and again, you could dim it. Or you can place a resistor, a variable resistor across it, 0 to 100,000 ohm pot, and that would allow you to adjust the brightness without having any additional equipment. So what I did is from DigiKey, I picked up a couple of these $3, 0 to 100 K, variable resistors and I'll show you how I use them when I do the assembly but basically what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to figure out how you want to mount it and one of the things that I decided to do is a lot of fish tanks out there this is a 10 gallon but many many fish tanks come with these rims and lips and so by taking a piece of anodized aluminum bar and notching out the corners down here after you've measured it. You could do it in a mill or if you're careful you could even do it with a file. You can place this in between the edges of the tank. Holds it nice and secure. And what's also nice about this is you can move the light back and forth. You could take it off but you can move it back and forth so that if you're accessing something inside of the tank you don't have a problem with um, the light getting in the way. Because these are stock material, you could obviously cut them to whatever length you want and that's another convenience. One thing you'll notice is that whenever you machine nice black anodized material, you end up with raw metal and that doesn't particularly look good. A little trick is rather than painting it, you can actually use a marker and you can draw with permanent marker on the back surface and cover up that raw metal and as you can see it goes quickly and it looks pretty nice. And you can also do that to the countersunk holes that you put inside there to hide the screws that you're going to use to mount that. Just paint this around inside here with the permanent marker and you can make it look nice and dark so that it's less visible. The other thing you'll notice is the hole that I drilled in the back here for the pot. Uh, I decided not to use the typical panel nuts to hold this in place. It's just a little ugly. So I drilled a hole that just fit the threaded diameter of the uh, pot and I placed a little bead of epoxy in there, shoved it in from the back, let it dry and now I have a very clean looking control that allows me to adjust the brightness of the light. So you'll see these pots have three leads. There's a center common conductor and then there's two uh, outside conductors and the way this works is that if you hook up a lead to the center conductor and then you hook up the other lead to say one of the other conductors. You'll notice that the resistance here is very low in this position of the dial. When I dial the um, pot to the other extreme, you'll see that the resistance goes all the way up to about 110,000 ohms. If I take that same conductor alligator and put it on the other 
of the of the two outside conductors. You'll notice now in this position of the dial it's at a low resistance and I turn it the other way in order to get it to the high resistance. Because the highest output of the uh, driver is at minimal resistance, essentially a dead short, you can then decide which of these two leads that you're going to want to connect to in order to have the dial turn in the orientation you wish for high power. In my case I'm going to be using the two rear conductors. So let's go over to the table and we're going to solder this up. Now just to make things convenient what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut off the back lead because it's just going to get in the way and make it harder for me to uh, do my soldering. So I'll cut this off and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do what's called tinning or put a little bit of uh, solder on the two leads that I'm going to end up connecting to the wires. So take a, just a brief pass with a little solder on here to wet the lead. You don't need to go very long. You don't want to heat up the internal components. And then what you need to do is you need to take the wires and do the same thing to them. In this case I've stripped these two wires. They're different colors but it's not necessary because there's no polarity here. And what you're going to end up doing is getting each of the wire leads uh, a little wet with the solder. It doesn't take much. And once you've done that, then what you're going to do is you're going to lay the lead next to the uh, conductor that you're going to attach it to and just use the soldering iron to heat that component right there to cause it to melt and then fuse solder to solder. Once you've got a good connection there, you can feel that it's nice and tight. Take the other wire and you'll go to the other lead, the center lead. You'll also wet this out as well before you begin so it sticks better. And then again holding this next to the conductor with the two adjacent to each other heat up the solder enough so that it melts and you glue them. Now in order to prevent shorting if I bend these conductors when I'm installing this I put a little heat shrink tubing over the end of the wire and feed it up to the conductor and I'll do that on each one of these two leads and this will prevent any kind of uh, accident from happening down the road when you manhandle this. Place these two up here, feed the heat shrink over the end of the uh, solder. Sometimes if you're not careful with the way that you've soldered these and they get a little big, sometimes it can be a little hard to get them on top. Then taking a blowtorch or you can use a hot air gun but this is pretty convenient. What you're going to do is just kiss this. You don't need much heat at all to get that to shrink. That's enough. Now we'll go over to the other table and we'll assemble the light. So now what we're going to do is actually assemble the light itself. And the first step is the bracket itself has some holes in it. And those holes line up with the pre-drilled holes in the heat sink, but only in one orientation. So if we put it down here on the heat sink, you'll see that when I orient it with this red dot and red line. The holes for the screws line up as well as the holes that I'm going to need for the retainer for the reflector. So turning this over and picking up the LED, the trick with this is that the red dot has to line here and these four uh, little square uh, indentations on the bracket are going to be what retain it. So you place it in so that the spring-loaded pin here is against one side and then you feed the LED in against that retainer and you'll hear it click when it gets down into position between these four edges. Then what you do is once you've got that nicely mounted, check to make sure you didn't mess it up, then take the heat sink material, take off the protective uh, plastic that they have to keep it clean. And then you're going to place it on the LED and the material is a little tacky. So when you put it on, don't press down too hard at first because you may want to shift it around a little bit just to get it close to covering the surface. It doesn't have to be perfect, but if you're a little better, you do a little bit better job, you'll get better heat distribution. Then take the plastic off the other side and then when you rotate this thing down, the tackiness keeps the uh, thermal pad on there. Now again, my red mark here on this side lines up with the red mark here. 
And before I make contact, I want to make sure my holes are pretty much in the right position because it doesn't slide well. So I'll get that just about perfect, like that. And then you're going to screw it in. These are 8 millimeter by M3 screws. And all of the holes in this entire uh, apparatus have the same diameter uh, hole, have the same diameter threaded hole. So it's easy to get the same screws for all the installation. That's kind of nice. Now I'm using button heads for these just because they have a larger uh, bonding, binding area. And that gives you a little bit better um, capture of the retaining bracket. And sometimes you, it's a little bit of a struggle to get things to line up perfectly. But if you take your time, using a ball headed driver is sometimes a hassle when you're trying to get a screw to go in straight. So I might recommend not using that. when you do this yourself. And once you have that tightened down, screw in the other one on the other side. That one's a little easier. Now the bracket wants cap head screws, so those are the ones that I'm going to use here to attach the bracket that's going to hold the reflector. And remember, if you don't get the orientation right, you won't have all four screws lining up. And it's a drag because then you have to take that, ref that thermal compound off the back or the thermal pad off the back because it will probably be sticky and try to hold the LED down. Now once you've attached both the LED as well as the reflector holder, you could, in theory, put the reflector on at this point. You could screw it down. But it's easier at this point to do the wiring first. And so what you do is you take the appropriate lead, obviously this is the positive, and feed it down through the pre-drilled hole here. Bring it all the way down. You'll worry about the backside later. I put a little tinning on here, a little copper, because this is stranded wire and it doesn't insert as well into the uh, clamp that holds this in position. But once you've done that, you then insert this in here and it just grabs it. And so then pull the wire the rest of the way out to make it nice and neat and do the same thing with the black lead. If you're using single-stranded wire, that sometimes is a little bit easier uh, for the installation because you don't have to solder it, but then it's usually not as flexible. So you insert that, clean that up a little bit. Now you can put the reflector on. And then, turning this over, using this as a support, what you can then do is you can then attach the brackets. Now make sure you get your orientation correct. In this case, these are, the back, these are the back ends, and I have these countersunk, so I want these obviously on the outside of the light. So I'm going to take these screws, once again, insert them into the holes, and I'm going to screw them into place. I don't tighten these down at this point because the tabletop, as nice as it looks, is not perfectly flat. And it's usually a good idea that when you do the final tightening because of the play in the screws, to uh, do the final tightening down on a very flat uh, reference surface so that you don't hit, get twist in the final assembly.
Now I'm going to take the reflector off so that it's only resting on the supports. And then when this is nice and square like this, then I'm going to tighten this up. That way it won't wiggle on the tank. And we'll do the holes on the other side too. Righty tighty, lefty loosey. Now, the next step is to run the wires into a neat package all together. And in order to do that, you want to feed these power leads through the heat sink pins so that they're not standing on top. You want to run them to, to a position where they're both running to basically the same exit position from the device. And you can choose how you want to do that. If you want to do it internally or you just want to kind of feed it through. Um, it doesn't really matter how you run these, but just be careful that the ends of these uh, heat sink probes, uh, the tines, are a little bit sharp. And so what you want to do is you want to be a little careful that you don't uh, damage the insulation when you push this through. Once you get these things run down pretty low and tight, or at least where you plan to eventually have this, then what you're going to do is you're going to take the wires and I just tighten it like this. There we go. You're now going to want to feed these through some spiral wrap. A little trick to this is if you start the spiral wrap out here someplace, you don't have to start it where you're going to eventually use it, but you start it up here and once you get both of the wires inside of the spiral wrap, then you can just rotate it around and it'll sort of move itself up. It's faster than sort of braiding hair uh, as you would if you had to wrap the, uh, the material around, which you'll eventually have to do as you'll see in just a sec. When you get to the point that the spiral wrap is at about the position where these other leads are going to enter, then what you do is you're going to feed them into the cluster and then you're going to begin wrapping all four leads at the same time. So that's about where I want these to go. So I'm going to bend these down a little bit like this, a little bit like this, so that they line up better. So now we just bring all of the wires in together and we're going to wrap the spiral wrap around all of them. Starting this out is a little pesky because you don't want to pull on anything. But once you get a few wraps with the cluster, then you can get a little bit faster. I'm wrapping that around all the way to the end. Now, the spiral wrap is nice because obviously unlike heat shrink tubing, it's easy to take it off if you need to at some point. In other applications, I like to use the heat shrink because it gives a little nicer look. We'll get to that in a second, but then what I want to do is the final sort of stabilization is to place a little clip on here that's going to be used to keep this in position on the back of the light so that I'm not pulling on the leads when I'm doing the um, maneuvering of this light around the tank. And to do that, what we're going to do is I've got a little button head here and I'm going to try to feed this through into its partner. It takes a little force sometimes. Like that. And then slide these up into the right position. And again, if you've got a ball driver, this can sometimes be a little bit more difficult than if you have a hard driver which can line up the screw. Now that that's nice and snugged in there, then we'll finish doing the wrap here. It's also nice to secure the spiral wrap up there because then as I'm swinging this stuff around, I'm not torquing any of the uh, conductors or the connectors, I should say, to the pot or the uh, LED. And it's always a good idea to cut off more wire and more spiral wrap than you're eventually going to need. Uh, be generous because the stuff is cheap and that way you never have to redo it because you are, oh, a little bit short. 
Now we're going to go over to the other table and I'm going to show you how we connect up the power cord. Now in some cases you want to be able to disassemble and assemble, but in, in the case of the power cord, I don't. I just want a permanent installation. So I could solder this up or I could use these crimp connectors. And one of the little tricks that I'm going to show you here is that I've taken the live, which in this case, aha, <laughs> taken the live, which in this case is the brown conductor, to the black conductor here. And I've taken each one of the leads and I've uh, connected them at a different length. And the reason for that is that when I put the uh, crimp connector on, they don't both line up and produce a big bulge at the same position, which is a nice thing so that when you wrap it, it's a much neater installation. So now that one goes to the black, and we'll connect that one up now too. And then we'll do this. Connect this guy up. Now you can either heat shrink this if you want to, or you can spiral wrap it. In this case, I'm just going to spiral wrap it. But you might decide that if you want to heat shrink it, that'd be a good, even neater look when you're done. There we go. And then finally, I'm going to take the heat gun and I'm going to heat these and shrink them in order to reduce their size. And also, this has an adhesive lining, so it provides a little bit better con uh, connection. Because of the exposed wire here, this might be a little bit sketchy, and you might not want to do this uh, unless you're really confident that you're going to be able to pull the wire away and do the heating properly. But the point being that it's this alternating length of wire that provides a very nice, tight connection. It's the same sort of method that we're going to use over here when we do the power cord and the um, dimming control. I've cut each one of these different leads a different length. So again, when I uh, pack them together, they're going to be a much neater installation. You can use for this sort of disconnectable interface these uh, crimp type of uh, bullet connectors that I use, I've been using for years in a lot of my projects. But you can also use these solderable uh, connectors. And I'm going to show you how to put these on because they're kind of neat. So the first thing that you're going to have to do to use one of these is you're going to have to fill up the cavity at the end with a little bit of solder. And because this is not heat sensitive here, it's possible to, to heat this up very, very hot and you're not going to damage anything even if you bring this to up to a very high temperature. So putting the soldering iron in the hole and then feeding the solder into the hole, you're going to fill it up with a volume of solder. Then what you do is you're going to take one of the connectors here and you're going to tin it with a little bit of solder just like I did before. But the trick in this case, a little different, is that because I don't want to heat the insulation a great deal, what I'm going to do to make the final connection is I'm going to make this particularly hot. I'm going to make this very molten and very, very hot so that when I stick the wire in here, the uh, wire will tend to cool it down as, it go, as it's inserted so that you don't overheat the insulation a great deal. Then hold this in alignment. It makes it a little bit easier to put the heat shrink on later. And you'll notice that the solder goes from a shiny silver to a sort of a dull gray when you've got a good bond. Now you want to let this cool a little bit because when you put the heat shrink tubing on this, if it's too warm, it'll shrink before it gets over the end. And one of the tricks to placing the heat shrink tubing on here is that you want to place the tubing down far enough so that it's just over the lip, the end of the uh, button co bullet connector. That way you'll have no metal exposed when you plug it into its mate. Another little trick is I'm using triple shrinking and adhesive lined uh, heat shrink tubing so it gives a very nice seal and also compensates for the small diameter of the wire. Another trick is always start your heat shrink at the button end because that's what will grab first and then it won't slide around on you. And then just go from all different surfaces, be careful of the wire, it doesn't take a lot of heating, and go from all different angles until you get a nice seal. Now when you do the female end, you're going to do the same sort of thing. 
and each of the different leads are going to have button connectors that allow you to have a nice smooth interface. The final result is that you have a removable connection here but a permanent connection on the other end and that permanent connection is nice because that way you're not going to be pulling it out of the wall but at the same time if you want to move the light or you want to exchange power supplies it's easy to do. I'm not going to show you all of these button connectors because this is going to get very tedious but what I will show you is the operation of the light once I connect it up and I'll show it to you on the tank. Okay, so I saved you some of the pain and suffering of doing each one of the leads, but as you can see, uh, I've uh, soldered and heat shrunk each one of the different connectors, and intentionally I haven't completely seated them so that you can see that when you put them together carefully and with some force, you pretty much make the conductors invisible. And that means there's a good chance, especially with the uh, alternating distance here, that you're not going to have any kind of shorting between the different connectors. Finally, you can put a piece of heat shrink around this, wrap this up, make this look nice. And because the heat, sh uh, heat shrink, did I say heat shrink? I meant spiral wrap. Because the spiral wrap is obviously removable, unlike the heat shrink, you can tighten everything up, make it look pretty good, it has the same black color as the leads. But then uh, at the same time, whenever you want to disconnect the light, it's easy to do it and you don't have to be cutting away any heat shrink tubing. This is probably going to be laying behind the uh, fish tank anyway, so even though it's a little bit of a bulge and it has a little bit of texture to it, uh, it's not going to be very easy to see when it's hanging down below the uh, level of the tank. Now I've got this plugged in right now <clears throat> and I've got it to minimal brightness. And so as I start to turn the pot, you have to reach a certain amount of voltage uh, and then you'll start to get a pretty good gain in power. And as I dial this up, you can see that this one light is incredibly intense. It's not hot, but right now it's running at about 100 watts. And obviously this is almost uh, sunlight brightness and that's just one of these two lights. So. Pretty nice project, pretty easy to do. The only tedious thing is uh, trying to get the connectors and make everything look nice. But one nice thing about building this yourself is you can make the leads as long as you want. And you can hide them and you can orient them however you like. You can also make this whatever size you want. And if you want to put multiple lights on top of a tank, being able to maneuver them around and being able to adjust the brightness <clears throat> at the point that you're uh, looking at the subjects inside the tank makes it really nice to work with. So hopefully, hopefully this was useful. Um, I'm going to be building a few of these, and I'm also going to be making a bunch of different arms so that we can cover a bunch of different sized tanks that we have. So I want to thank you again for watching, and uh, look forward to seeing you next time.